Oh. 
your hands all across this place right now. Oh, I feel the presence of the Lord sweeping through this house. <laughs> God, we give you glory and honor today. Come on, there's nobody like our God. We exalt you, Lord. We give you praise from the depths of our heart, from the depths of our soul. for the sacrifice you made for us. <laughs> Our hearts are filled with praise and worship for you today. You're good to us, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. I Falling thank you, Lord, for your presence, love. God. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. Jesus, God, you're oh, so good to us today. Falling in love.
Jesus, it's the best thing I've ever, ever done. Amen. Praise God. Good to be here in the house of the Lord today. Beautiful presence of the Holy Ghost. It's in the house. Amen. And we can rest assured if we'll gather together in his name that his presence will be here. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to read from the scripture. Uh, just before I do that, though, I want to encourage us as a church to be compassionate toward one another and to those that are in our world and what they're going through. I believe that God will put us into circumstances and situations that we are able to offer up some help to extend the helping hand and to be able to show someone that we care. And uh, as you go through your daily life, you will find that God will open up those doors. You're able to extend that helping hand to a neighbor, someone that's uh, having some difficulty that you are in their vicinity. And I believe that God will, God will help and God will bless. I, I was reminded of that the other day as I was at a place of business. An individual was having some difficulty operating uh, one of the gas pumps that was there. And uh, I kept watching, I kept watching. And, and uh, you know, you kind of wonder, do you say something? Do you offer some help or something of that nature? And, and finally, the older gentleman just got frustrated enough where he said, I, I'm going to get back in my car and and uh, you know leave this behind and uh, it was it was one of those places he, he, it was Sam's Club actually and he'd already waited in line I don't know how long to, to get up to the pumps and I could tell he was kind of just frustrated and I looked back at him and I said hey you, you, you're having some problems you need some help he said well it just won't work and as soon as I spoke that you need some help the attendant that was just over a few rows heard me say that, come over and say, somebody needs some help. And he extended that hand to uh, that gentleman, helped him get through that. You say, well, that's something simple. Well, I also read this week about a, a family that was at another place of business. And they witnessed an, uh, an incident, if you please. And they thwarted a kidnapping because they extended a helping hand. Um, we need to be sensitive and and we need to be ready to help and, and have compassion to our world you never know what that's going to open up in conversation or witnessing to those people that god directs you to amen you say well you know pastor i i need to be sensitive don't i and i say y y and yes you do you need to be sensitive and i'm going to i'm going to tell you how you can become very sensitive and that is when you decide I'm going to fast for like three days. You'll be able to smell the restaurant food as you're traveling down the road at 50 miles an hour. You'll be able to detect what they're cooking over there and, and how good it smells. Where before it didn't even, you know, affect you and all of us, but you become more sensitive to it. Not only that, you'll begin to eat salads and you'll begin to eat green beans and you'll eat all of those kind of things that usually you turn your nose up to because all of a sudden you have become more sensitive to those particular items. Amen. When you're hungry, praise God. When we're hungry for the things of God, when we're hungry for the moving of the Spirit and fasting is a part of our worship and a part of of our disciplines and such and it not only makes us sensitive in the natural sense it makes us sensitive in the spiritual sense to the things of God to the voice of God and to the will of God in your life and so this month is 30 days of prayer and fasting that's why I wanted to kind of throw that in there that we would keep uh, praying believing God setting time aside to fast and to grow closer to the Lord amen Praise God. Let's turn to the word of the Lord, John chapter 19, verses 19 through 22. Pilate wrote a title. 
and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. It was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin that everyone that came by saw what was happening, could recognize, could hear, could see just who that was that was hanging upon that cross. And the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Quite the statement and the stand that was taken that as I read that story or as I read those scriptures, I would say, in my opinion, that was a very defining moment. Pilate had looked upon Jesus. He'd heard all the complaints and all of the accusations toward Jesus. And as he calculates, deliberates all of the prior words and proceedings Pilate decided to write Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews in my opinion he determined in himself that the man that stood before him was in fact the king of the Jews and there was nothing that could convince him otherwise it didn't matter what others said their arguments were already dismissed, if you please. And he said, this is what I have written. While these, this event was a defining moment as to Pilate and who Pilate was even to himself, it was also a defining moment as to who Jesus was was to Pilate and to the Jews and really to the entire world. The power of such words can be seen in the response of the chief priests. It's as if they're objecting. Objection, Your Honor. Objection. Strike that statement from the record. Pilate overrules. The objection is invalid and the statement stands as it is written. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. Drop down another verse. Right there. But ye are a chosen generation. I want to stop just for a moment at those three words. But ye are. Not going to be, not possibly be, but you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people. It goes on and it talks about which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And all of this is because you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But you are defined as chosen, royal, holy, peculiar. 
people, but not just the people, but the people of God. And you're called to praise and worship and adore the Almighty God, the God that brought you out of darkness into light, that brought you out of sorrow into joy, that transformed your life. I want to talk to us for just a few minutes this morning on the things that define me. The things that define me. Let's pray. God of heaven, I thank you, God, for your presence and power. Thank you, Lord, for the touch of the Holy Ghost that we feel in this room. I pray, God, as your word goes forward, it would touch every heart under the sound of my voice. Each and every individual that will hear these words, I pray, God, that they would feel a touch of the Holy Ghost and they would respond in the affirmative to the things of God in their life. Let them to be recipients of your blessings. God, let health and well-being to be upon your people. And we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Bible contains many references that define certain individuals by their occupation, let's say. We read in the scripture of individuals such as Joseph the carpenter or Alexander the coppersmith, Simon the tanner, or even Nehemiah the cupbearer. Or the ID may come by geographical association, such as Naboth the Jezreelite, or Lazarus of Bethany, and Joseph of Arimathea, Saul of Tarsus. Others are defined by physical condition or affliction. You read of Simon the leper, Aeneas sick of the palsy, Mephibosheth, the, the lame man, or blind Bartimaeus. And then we've kind of come up with a few of our own as well. We have Thomas the doubter, Judas the traitor, Peter the denier, or on a more positive note, John the revelator. We have our way of tagging an individual's life and experience by certain information and things that may, may come to us. And we, we put that defining uh, statement or that defining uh, decision or description of that individual. Uh, there are times when that we, we look at individuals and we will say something like, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That phrase is typically said in connection with children who show qualities or talents that are similar to those of their parents. You're the chip off the old block or the spitting image of your dad. You're being defined by the shared characteristics that you have with your parents. And that's not a bad thing. It's not always a bad thing. Matter of fact, Paul in writing to Timothy wrote of uh, really much the same thing when he said, I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you, which first dwelt in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it's in thee also. You're a chip off the old block. You're a spitting image. You're, you're, you're displaying the, the characteristics of a parent. And he was speaking of some good things that come by being defined by someone else. But I want to talk for just a 
few minutes here today and go through a few examples of individuals that have been defined or could have been defined by the adversity that they went through or the thoughts of someone else upon their life, what someone else determined or what a sickness or a disease or some other uh, physical ailment might have determined who they were. Naaman is defined as captain, honorable, reputable, courageous in the face of danger. This man has quite the resume that most anyone would admire and most anyone wouldn't mind having necessarily for themselves. Honorable man, a reputable man, courageous, his master loved him and was proud of his association with him. And yet we read as we go further into his description until you get to those last few words. And it's like a dagger to the heart when the words were written, but Naaman was a leper. All the good that you've done, all of the battles that you have fought, all of the accomplishments that you have made are now going to be reduced to nothing by a diagnosis of the medical field. All of your, your efforts are going to now be wasted away by the diagnosis of a disease. Naaman, your life is now going to be defined by an affliction. And it was not until someone instead spoke to, to Naaman's heart that, that someone else was able to say something different than what the diagnosis had said. That there was someone that was able to come up with some words that would somehow redefine Naaman's life. And we read that the young maiden says, Would to God that my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. What he said, or what the maiden was saying is, you don't have to go down in the annals of history as a leper. You do not have to go down in history as defeated you can contact the almighty God would to God that my master would somehow come in contact with the prophet oh if he would only come in contact with the man of God the disease would not define him as to what he truly is we could go further in to Naaman's life and Naaman's response. Notice how that the prophet gives the instruction and Naaman at the beginning basically refuses the instruction, gets mad about it. There are times that that you'll receive instruction that you're going to get upset about, that you're, not, that you're going to think, well, isn't there some other way? Hey, if you're feeling down in the dumps today, if you're feeling, uh, you know, overwhelmed, if you're fearful, if you're, if you're doing, if you're experiencing that in your life, Turn off CNN, turn, turn off, uh, you know, all of these news things, turn off Fox, turn off all that stuff and stop pumping, uh, you know, your head full of negativism and think on the things of the Lord. And the Bible even, I'm, I'm standing on the word of God by saying that to you. Whatsoever things are good, what, you know, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are a good report, think on those things. Hey, you might be mad at me already. You didn't like the instruction I gave either. <laughs> Sorry, I had to just throw that in there. But Naaman was not happy with what the 
the prophet told him he needed to do. But thank, speak to God that Naaman's not defined by his anger even. He could have, could have been. He could have, it could have gone down. The, the last line that you could have read about Naaman was he was so mad about what the, what the prophet had said that he remained a leper to the day that he died. But oh, thanks be to God that he didn't let anger even define who he was going to be in the future. And he said, oh, and he came to himself and he obeys the commandments and he does what he's told and instructed to do. And you know the end of the story as Naaman it's cleansed of his leprosy. Job. Job is defined. Satan's calling him out. It's what he did. All of that worshiping and all of that sacrifice that you have been doing, all of that sacrifice and worshiping that has been made is going to be diminished, reduced to nothing. Because Job, you're just a gold digger. You're just in this because of what's in it for you. The only reason that you sacrifice, the only reason that you worship is because of all of the stuff that you have, because of all of the possessions that you have. You're a fake. You're, you're an, an imposter. You're a counterfeit worshiper, Job. And Job is called out by the devil. Calling him out and, and saying that what he's been doing is just a big put on and it's just been a show. Job, Satan is telling you, who, uh, telling us uh, that your worship is rooted in materialism and it's rooted in self righteousness. Uh, but I want to tell you something uh, Job refuses uh, to succumb to the devil's definition uh, of who he truly is. While he could have just kind of keeled over and died. While he could have just cursed God and died. And while the enemy is sounding out in heaven against his worship and against his praise and against his sacrifice. You shouldn't be doing this. The only reason you're doing it is because you're in trouble. The only reason that you're trying to live for God now is because you're sick in your body. The only reason that you're trying to do something right is because of ulterior motives and situations situations in your life I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus and let us show God even this day purpose in our hearts that our worship goes up to God because we love him I refuse today to be identified with the definition that the devil may have for me and for us Mephibosheth I've mentioned his name the grandson of King Saul. At five years old, his nurse is seeking to, to protect him uh, from, from death because there was a, a uh, regime change, if you please, and all of King Saul's uh, uh, descendants, uh, children, grandchildren and such, would have been killed. But to protect uh, Mephibosheth, he is grabbed up and, and they're, they're running to, to protect him. And there's, there's an accident. They, they fall. Mephibosheth falls down. And the Bible says he became lame in both of his feet. Later on, we, we read about how the King David inquires, Is there anyone, is there anyone of the house of Saul that I may show some kindness to for Jonathan's sake. Is there anyone that is left in the house that I can bless? Is there anyone that needs what I've got? Is there anyone that could be available to receive a blessing? And the reply comes back to King David, yes, Jonathan hath yet a son. Jonathan has a son that is still alive, but he's lame on his feet. He's damaged. Something has happened in his life prior that he has the markings 
of that accident, that failure. Damaged goods, if you please. David calls for Mephibosheth. And when Mephibosheth arrives on the scene, the Bible says that he bows down before David. And he said this, What is thy servant that thou should look upon such a dead dog as I am? Even Mephibosheth himself realized that he was damaged goods, or that was his opinion. He was being defined by the brokenness of his feet. He was being tagged with, oh yes, he's a son of Jonathan, but he is lame. There's always this tag that kind of gets put on there, this label that gets put on there that says, oh yes, he, he, he's... He's qualified and, and, and he's connected and, and, and he's related to you, but, but there's something that's wrong in his life that's going to possibly disqualify him. Maybe it's going to be something that says, uh, you know what, uh, King, you really don't want to bless this guy. You really don't want to invest anything in him. You really don't want to uh, in any way restore anything that would have been his as a son of the king. Uh, he's, he's hurt and he's damaged and, and he can't walk right. Uh, and all this is going on in his life. He's damaged goods. There are those that's in our world today that are controlled by the damage that is done in their life. It's time to get past your past. You got to get past your past. I, 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 I can't. I can't run because of prior hurt. I, I can't run because of prior pain. I, I can hardly live because of the prior damage in my life. I wonder today, are you defined by the damage that has been done in your life? Are you uh, damaged goods? Are you in the place where that you just feel like uh, there's no way the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords would ever, could ever, would ever bless my life? And I'm here to tell you, I believe that if you're not careful, you'll be defined by the damage that's been done in your life uh, in years and years and years ago that will prevent you from ever getting into the presence of the King of Kings and receiving the blessing that God wants to put into your life. Hear me today. The king, Mephibosheth, the king is going to sustain you. The king is going to restore what the enemy has taken from you. The, the king is going to give back to you. That's what's been taken in that damage into your life. Uh, the king is going to bless you even though the damage is there. One of the things that Jesus left to us was the words that they will hate you because of me. They will hate you because of your identification with me. And everyone will hate you because you are mine and are called by my name. That you are defined by my name. And you will be continually hated by everyone because of your association with me and my name. When Jesus said those things, he was letting us know that the world would try to define us. But that he would have a much higher opinion of us. That the world would try to put a label on us that would hinder us and ultimately defeat us. But into the heart of the apostle, he says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation. I refuse to be identified with an unholy nation. I refuse to, to just just, just being involved with uh, something of natural royalty, but it's a royal priesthood. I refuse to look at our generation as though we're abandoned by God. Yeah. 
the world may call us strange and odd and weird and stupid and all kinds of other things that they might want to use to try to describe us. But God said, you're just peculiar people. In times past, you were not a people, but now, now, you're the people of God. <laughs> you're the people of God. Wait, you're not just a people. You're the people of God. You're not just a son or daughter. You're a child of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now you have. We must let Jesus define us. What man calls a waste of treasure, God calls it a sacrifice. What man calls a waste of time, God calls it dedication. What man calls a waste of talent, God calls it faithfulness. What mankind says is a waste of energy, a waste of time. God calls it worship. We have got to be very careful in these last days that we don't allow the world to define us and define our relationship with the Almighty God. Oh, you don't have to do that. Oh, oh you don't have to. You don't have to get so emotional. You don't have to get so involved. That's not unholy. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Who is it that's going to define to us what is righteous, what is holy, what is acceptable to God? Who are we going to allow to define what a family is? I don't know about you, but I refuse to let the world define my relationship with the Almighty God and what truly is sacrifice and what truly is faithfulness and what truly is dedication and what truly is worship in my life toward Him with the power of God that is behind us today, church with the miracles of Jesus that are available to us. They are available, aren't they? We need to refuse to go down in history definitively as the woman with the issue of blood. Definitively as the demoniac of Gadara. Definitively as the man with the withered hand or the lame beggar by the beautiful gate. What are you saying? Those things could have been upon their life for the rest of their days. And even to this day. But I choose to be defined Oh, as the anxious woman who's made whole, as the possessed man who is set free, as the injured man who is completely healed, and as the beggar man that has been made rich. The stand always. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. I'm not letting you redefine my life with that kind of a statement. Once a failure, always a failure. Once a liar, always a liar. Once a cheat, always a cheat. No, no, no. I'm not going to let you put 
those kind of name tags upon my life or upon the people of this church. Such were some of you as the scripture declares. We're not going to let the enemy put a tag upon us and define us when God has changed everything that there is to change within my life. Friend, let me tell you something. The thing that defines me is Jesus Christ. He will be the one who defines me. He will be the one that judges me. He will be the one that makes me what I am. I want us to sing and worship the Lord here for a few moments. I'm telling you that the world is trying to push their definition upon the church. The, the world is trying to put all kinds of labels you think all of the things that are going against the church right now are just there by you know just circumstantial or just by accident I don't believe so Oh, you don't need to go to church. You can stay home and watch it on TV. It's not the same. I don't care what you say. It's just not. You don't need to sing in church. Really? Apostolic, Pentecostal, church, church believing Christian people? are going to look at what the scripture says about our worship and, and accept? What do you mean I don't need to sing in church? What, what do you mean I don't need to lift my hands? What do you mean I don't need to come to church? That's who I am. That's what I am. God is defining me. He defined us as a church. He's defined us as a people. You are the people of God. You're chosen. I want us to sing. Uh, I need to stop. Right? Let's worship the Lord. Let's just ask God to help us to be everything that God truly wants for us to be today. Thank you, Jesus. Would you lift up your hands and just worship the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, define me. Make me what I am. Spirit of God, in the name of Jesus. You Worship thought him. I was what saved. I reached to you, God. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. Come on, 88 1 out there. Be defined as a you worshiper of the Lord. Inside Give God praise and worship in your heart. Lord. So I could be I home, you, Lord. so I could tell everyone I know you thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. Feel free so to approach this altar me today. Up inside. You thought I was Feel free to touch home. the Almighty God. I can only touch him so I could be whole and be redefined. So I could tell everyone God I can do a work in my you life. You thought I was worth saving. Yes, you did. You came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. Oh, Lord Jesus. So you cleaned me up inside. You thought I was to die for. In the name of Jesus. freedom in my spirit. You need to touch him. You need to touch the throne of God. God, let your transforming power to work through my mind. In the name of Jesus. Oh, my Lord. To the God change my life and I will praise you forever. Worship you.
worship you, worship you, give you glory. Myself to you, Jesus. So I can be free. 